Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my walkthrough for Chrono Trigger for Nintendo DS. This video covers the chapter titled To Break the Seal, which takes place just after we have been kicked out of 12,000 BC and locked out of there by Shala, who sealed up the gate under orders of the Prophet. So now we can't get back to 12,000 BC in the normal way, so we're gonna have to find some other method of doing so. However, now that we have access to the pendant, which has now been fully charged, we can now open doors with mysterious crests on them. And then at this point, one of your characters will then mention, where have I seen that mysterious crest before? And it will then show the scene showcasing the Keeper's Dome in 2300 AD, which is a little bit odd because it's it's not guaranteed that everybody has gone there. In fact, um, it's an optional area, so a lot of you probably didn't. Anyways, we're gonna go to 2300 AD and go to that mysterious door, which is our next objective. And along the way, we can open up all the other sealed doors, which we now have access to as well. So I've mentioned this before, but now that we've completed Tyranno Lair, one of the other things that happened is that now all of the happy water has dried up here in Ioka Village, so they can't heal with that anymore, which is very sad. They don't know why this is happening, but it is kind of ominous. At the same time though, just so you know, because Lavos crashed into to the earth and as a meteorite or whatever. Now this particular time period is going to start moving into an ice age, which was probably gonna happen all along anyways, but it just is a sad thing. Like it's gonna get real rough for them here very shortly. So work your way back through Mystic Mountain, go through the gate to return to the end of time. And what you'll find is that two of the pillars of light are missing. Now, if you had gone to 12,000 BC and then you returned to the end of time, you would have seen this actually, that there was uh, more pillars here at one point, so now they're missing. Uh, but a lot of you, if you just followed along with me, we just went directly to 12,000 BC and we didn't return to the end of time at that point. Um, we, we had a nice full complete set of nine gates here at the end of time, but now we don't have that anymore. So the reason for that too, by the way, is because each gate has um, an entry point, an exit point, or whatever, it has two ends to it, except for Protodome, that's actually the only exception. But every other gate has an entry point and an end point. So because she sealed up the gate leading from Tyranno Lair to 12,000 BC, uh, both of those are now missing here at the end of time. So anyways, if you speak with the old man, he'll talk about it and he'll say that the next place you should go, he'll give you a hint and say that you should go speak with the old man who is working on the wings of time. So to get there, the fastest way is actually to take 2300 AD Protodome and then just go race against Johnny and then go to the abandoned sewers. However, if you would like to take a slight detour that's a little bit longer, we can get a whole bunch of goodies along the way. First, we want to take the gate that leads to Banger Dome and then use the pendant on the doorway just to the north to get a whole bunch of goodies inside. The Workman's Wallet is a very handy item that I've talked about before, but the new thing we're getting here is actually the Alluring Top, otherwise known as the Charm Top. This is an Amla exclusive item that will increase the success rate of her charm ability, which is pretty nice, so it's less likely to fail. You can also use the Dual Tech Twin Charm as an alternative to that as well. But anyways, this is a very nice item. Um, as a comment though, the name seems to imply that it would be like an armor piece, like a chest slot, but it's not actually, it's an accessory, which is handy for gameplay reasons. That's like more of a quality of life thing and I appreciate that. However, at this point, just know that Ayla is kind of in full plate and everything, so I'm not actually sure how alluring this would actually be. So after getting all the goodies in Banger Dome, head south to Trandome and open up all these chests as well. There is also a magic capsule in the corner, so be sure to grab that and don't forget. Next, we're gonna work our way all the way over to Eris Dome, which is kind of in the middle, in between uh, Banger Dome and Proto Dome. So we just, you have to either go through the race with Johnny or like go through all the enemies there or go through Site 16. So I'd recommend just go through Site 16, it's pretty easy. Um, you can sneak past the enemies or you can just kill them. I, honestly, they all have so little health at this point. You can use any of our full screen clear abilities and it's fine. So use Lightning 2, Fire 2, Ice 2, Water 2. You can even use some Shadow abilities, although some enemies will actually absorb Shadow in this particular area. So I'd recommend not using Robo for that. You're better off with one of the other abil abilities that somebody has. So I'd recommend Chrono, just use Lightning 2 and everything and it's fine. Um, even if you kill every single enemy encounter here, I think you have enough MP to support that for the most part. Otherwise, if you're worried about it, you can't equip that gold stud that we just got. The most exciting item in Trandone that we got is the gold stud, in my opinion. It's a very useful item that I will be using for the rest of the entire game. What it does is it reduces MP cost by 75%. And I do actually have a couple of those because I won some in the Arena of Ages, which is handy, but it's not required or anything. Really what it is is whatever, like, text or dual text you're planning on using, whatever character is going to be using the most expensive one, then you want to give them a gold stud. Because, like for example, there's a lot of abilities that cost 20 MP. It's really expensive. Those are really good abilities, but you can basically only cast them a couple times, and otherwise you're using tons and tons of ethers. But if you can give them the gold stud, that allows you to use them all the time because it reduces the cost down to five, which is wonderful. We're kind of at this weird turning point in the game too, where we start having these abilities that cost 20 MP. Now those are generally speaking the best abilities for bosses, especially the single target ones. And then also there's multi-target ones that hit everything on the screen. And those will pretty much kill everything that's even our level. So enemies that are my in my tier, the stuff I should be fighting, I can kill all that stuff with one hit with one character. It just costs a lot of MP. 
But, you know, if I have the gold stud on, it doesn't cost hardly anything, then it doesn't matter, and I can do it for a whole bunch of combat for the entire area. So it's just great. You can move through an entire zone and kill everything with just one character, which is really crazy. Anyways, the gold stud is amazing because it just makes those abilities a lot more practical. Now, if you remember from earlier, when we first got to Aristone, we had to go find a password downstairs, and then we had to use it on a nearby control console in order to open up a nearby door. Well, technically what it is, it created a little platform. So this console does the exact same thing. It creates this little square platform here, so you're going to have to put in the password again in order to create this platform if you didn't do it earlier in the game when I recommended you do so. And again, as a reminder, that password is holding down L and R at the same time and then pressing the A button. Now, if you are playing on a emulator. Um, this is a common uh, problem people have online, apparently. So if you're playing on an emulator, then just change the controls to make L and R the same button at the same time temporarily, or even L, R, and A. All of them on the same button, and then just press the button on the console, and then change it back. For some reason, emulators apparently can only press a certain number of buttons at a time, or something like that. I don't quite understand. Whatever. Regardless, that's the solution if that's what you're currently running into. So collect all the goodies and make sure you grab these strength capsules in the middle of the floor, and that concludes all of the optional sealed doors that are here in 2300 AD, so now we're finally ready to continue on with the main story. So, our objective is to go to Keeper's Dome. To get there, you just go to the Abandoned Sewers, which is just to the right of Aristone, which is where we are right now. So go ahead and leave, go to the right, enter the Abandoned Sewers. The, the Sewers is actually a, an area that wasn't required until now. However, you could optionally have gone there before and gotten some goodies and got, completed an optional boss and stuff. However, at this point in the game, we're so overpowered compared to the level of everything here that you'll probably just one-shot everything, including the boss. <laughs> so it's not a big deal at all. So you just run through the abandoned sewers, kill it all if you haven't gone through here yet, and you'll easily make your way to the end. One comment as far as something you should know is there is a little tricky spot where you have to hit a switch that's hidden inside this wall. So you go through this little alcove and then activate the switch, and then go the long way around so you can go through the doorway. And that's the, kind of the one uh, tricky spot about the sewers, I suppose, that's worth noting. So anyway, if this is the first time you're doing the Abandoned Sewers and you're doing it at this point in the game, that's probably the biggest tip I can give you as far as things that could potentially mess you up and you get stuck on. So with that tip out of the way, I think the rest of the sewers is all pretty straightforward. Um, it is There's a little, lot of little combat and stuff like that. It should be easy for you at this point. The rest of the puzzles are all super straightforward, so I don't really think that I need to go into it right now. I did cover it very in-depth in a previous video, so if you go to my Chrono Trigger playlist, it's the video titled The Abandoned Sewers. So I'll have a link to that in the description, so if you would like more detailed information about that, you can check that out right now. Continuing on with the main story, we have just arrived at Keeper's Dome, and you'll find out that Old Bro's status has been updated to Dead Bro, which is very sad. Very bad timing on that. So the new here says that he recently just buried his master, and he's ready to kick the bucket as well. However, there's one last task he needs to perform, but he can't remember what it is exactly. Oh well, it's probably not important, right? So pro tip, if you ever want to leave a diary behind for other people to read on purpose, but you want to make it extra special, extra magical, you make them glowy, sparkly, invisible walls instead that they have to inspect before you can continue onwards. It makes it really epic. So this is actually just a whole bunch of information that you should have actually already figured out. I think, I don't think there's any details here that is things that we don't know or characters didn't speak of if you were paying attention anyways. However, it was all disjointed and it was all over the place over the course of the whole game. So this is just gathering all that information together and like labeling it, laying it all out for you very concisely in a nice, efficient manner. So it's just nice. It's kind of like a refresher of all the kind of little details we've been picking up throughout the game. So apparently Old Bro set up camp here so we could monitor the Lavos spawns that are coming off of Death Peak. So apparently um, all these little Lavos, Chibi Lavos babies are appearing on Death Peak and they're steadily coming down as an avalanche of death and carnage. So um, Balthazar set up camp here so we could monitor them and study them and everything, which is sad. I'm not sure how that works, I guess. I guess Death Peak is kind of like a Metroid daycare would be the best way to describe it. I'm not sure how the uh, Lavos spawns, what they're plan is exactly because Lavos is embedded in the earth. Are the other Lavos going to do that too? Or do they just like, once they get big and strong, do they just launch themselves into space and then slingshot around the earth and shoot off into a space to go towards another solar system? Or I'm not sure how that works exactly, but either way, it doesn't seem like a very sustainable plan. But yeah, like I said, if you were paying attention to a lot of things that people say throughout the game, I think every other piece of information that's here in these like diary entries are all like things you could have figured out or you should know by now if you are really paying attention anyways. And so, in fact, the fact that this guy, this is kind of the reveal that it's Belthazar, the guru of reason. But again, if you were paying attention, you would have known that. Especially, too, like, you come here earlier to Keeper's Dome and he even, like, introduced himself as that, too. He's like, hey, how's it going? I'm Belthazar, the guru of reason. I invented the Blackbird and the Ocean Palace. Ha ha! And he's, like, all proud of himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at the time, that didn't make any sense. But now that we have been to 12,000 BC, that totally makes sense. And that's a big reveal. So, it's kind of like if you had known that earlier than when people were talking about it in 12,000 BC that 
Balthazar was the guru of reason, you'd be like, wait, I didn't, don't I know him? But anyways, so it's just a cool little thing. Anyways, so once you get to the very end, then Balthazar will, his last entry will say that he's leaving you with his latest and greatest invention, which is the Wings of Time. So go through the door at the end and then inspect the device. You want to stand in the front of it and then whoever characters you have will then have various reactions. I feel like the characters that have the most enjoyable dialogue for this whole section is Marl and Luca. That's just slightly different, but I like theirs the most. Um, anyways, so after that, you'll go back towards the entrance and you'll meet up with a new who is bringing the stairs to get into the, or the chairs, to get into the ship itself. And apparently the new reveals himself to be Balthazar, or at least he has uploaded his memory into it. I'm not sure what this means. Are the news, like, are they organic creatures? Are they constructs or something like that? I guess that would make sense that if in uh, 12,000 BC they were magical constructs, maybe? Although, at the same time, though, the location where we see the most news by far is 65 million BC, before magic existed. So whatever that means. I'm not sure what the news are. Of course, they could just be robots that are shaped the same as news. Newbots. So now we have the opportunity to name our ship, which is Epic starting out, and I think that's a very appropriate name because it's a very uh, suitable, tiny kind of name, which is uh, very suitable for what we're going to be doing in this game, which is cool. So I will say that the default name is Epic. Eh, eh, eh. So go back to the previous room, and there is a magic capsule here on the floor. It is only present here after you have spoken with a new after collecting the ship. So um, you just return here, grab that real quick before you forget, then return to the ship. Now you can also speak with Anu to get some final instructions on how to use the ship. And basically all you really need to know is with the Y button and the A button. That's it, super basic. Go ahead and use the seats when you're ready to disembark. So for some versions of the game at different points, there are cinematics that play, and one of them takes place right now. Now, for the sake of the walkthrough, though, I don't actually have it included. I've cropped it out. But if you are interested in watching the cinematic that takes place when you board the Epic right now, you can look up uh, Chrono Trigger, Chrono Epic um, Cinematic, and you should find it right away on YouTube or something. So look that up if you want to. That's what takes place right now. Now, when you finally get into the Epic, what you want to do is you can use either the L and R button or the control pad to move around and select which time period you want to go to. Notice that we do, in fact, have access to 12,000 BC. However, we don't actually want to go there right now because there's a whole bunch of goodies we can now get. So you notice how I got a whole bunch of sealed doors here in 2300, and we got a whole bunch of really good items, actually. So there's even more Epic items we can get in other time periods. So now that we finally have access to this, we should totally do that. Real quick, though, I am going to stop by the end of time and speak with the old man there in the center. As a quick side note, if you did not get the magic capsule with me just a little bit ago, then what'll happen is actually the old man here will remind you to go get it. He'll say, hey, by the way, there's a magic capsule back there. You should go get it. So if that happens, all you have to do is just go back into the epic by hopping, like going to the little bridge thing across to the right, and then hop back into the epic and go to 2300 AD. And then that'll take you right back to that room and you can go ahead and go south and grab the magic capsule and go back into the epic and go back to the end of time. Anyway, he says that we should go back to 12,000 BC. No! We're going to go somewhere else first. Instead, take the Pillars of Light and go to either Medina Village or um, Lean Square 1000 AD, either one of those two. I'm going to start with Medina. I think it's a little bit faster, a little bit easier, but either direction is fine. So if you remember earlier in the game, I was saying that there was a blue pyramid just north of Medina Village that we couldn't do anything with, but we would unlock it eventually. So now we finally have access to that because we can remove the seals on objects using Marl's Pendant. So we'll go ahead and throw the pendant at it, and this will break the seal on it so we gain access to the Forbidden Shrine. This is the um, floating island that was in the far top right corner of the Magic Kingdom in 12,000 BC. So it was said it was sealed by order of Queen Zeal, and so we weren't able to do anything with it. And there were some people in town that were saying, well, eventually you could probably unlock it. So apparently there is a new inside who gives us instructions. He says there's two treasures. However, we can only pick one and the other one will be destroyed. I don't understand why that would be, but whatever. This is left here behind by the Guru of Reason, who is Balthazar, the dude who just gave us the Wings of Time. That doesn't actually make much sense to me. I think it would make a lot more sense if it was left behind by the Guru of Life, although I don't want to spoil anything to explain why that is. Regardless, um, continuing onwards, you have to choose which weapon you want. So one of them is a really powerful weapon, which is for Chrono. It's plus three speed, a huge amount of attack, really good weapon, but eventually it will be outclassed by other things. Meanwhile, on the left is the Guardian Helm slash Safe Helm, which can be used on any character. It's a pretty good um, helmet in general, and it is viable for the entirety of the game. So I would highly recommend, and you can use it on multiple characters, so I would highly recommend you get the Guardian Helm just in general. It's a better item overall. What this does is it applies the safe status, which reduces incoming physical damage by one third. Very useful for really high damage physical uh, bosses in particular. Very useful to toss out, especially on one of the girls, so either Marl or Luca. So next, head over to the Hecran Cave over to the far left and just follow the linear path until you get to the next sealed chest. Now, just so you know, I have been messing around with the Arena of Ages and I have unlocked Tier 5 
and tier 5 has a lot of the items that are found in these chests and stuff. So I actually already have a Guardian Helm and a Swallow in my inventory. So the two items that you can get from that pyramid, I actually already have them, which is kind of crazy. It's pretty overpowered. Um, but anyway, it's a little bit ridiculous. So I actually already have those. Again, though, between the two of them, I still think the Guardian Helm is the best choice. And then this next chest here in Hecarim Cave has two items in it, the Barrier Ring slash Wall Ring and the Speed Ring slash Dash Ring. I want to throw that Speed Ring on Luca to increase her speed just a little bit further. Just a little bit nice, plus three speed instead of plus two. And then as far as the Barrier Ring, just so you know, that's plus ten to magic defense. In particular, I'd say the best character to put that on by far is going to be Robo and Ayla. So if you really want to use them against a boss because you really like their dual techs or whatever, uh, but a boss that is vulnerable to physical, but they have hit with really hard magic damage, sometimes Ayla and Robo just get totally pwned with that. So this is a way you can kind of band-aid that so they can actually survive. But yeah, very good item. I would say, honestly, it can reduce magic damage they take by somewhere between like 10% and 40%. So like 40% damage reduction is like a big deal. Now, just so you know, if you ever want to go back to the Vortex, you can also access from this side by standing right here on these little trees right here. This is the teleport point that takes you into the Vortex, which is a weird location, I know. But that from there, you can press A to select it, and you can hop into the Whirlpool and, like, go through Hecarim Cave the opposite direction. So if you want to go either direction, you totally can. So you can totally do that same thing that I just did, but start from Lean Square instead, and then go all the way to Medina Village either way. So right now I'm going back to the end of time because I want to take the gate that leads to Guardia Forest. Now unfortunately, the only way we can get to Guardia Forest in 1000 AD now is to take this gate. It's kind of weird. The only purpose this gate has now is just to get this particular chest. Because ever now that we have the epic, they've actually blocked it off and put, um, like, put this big wall of dirt there, which is kind of weird. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose is of this, um, but it doesn't really matter now that we have the epic. And that'll actually be, we'll be able to travel even better here very shortly as well. Now this leads to a power ring, which will increase our strength by six, which is a pretty nice little item. It's just better than, like, the power scarf we've been using so far. So that concludes all the chests that are easier to get with gates for now. The remaining chests are all in 600 and 1000 AD. However, um, I think it's a lot easier to get to them using the epic. Now, one thing to understand about using the epic, though, is it will remain wherever you left it, both as far as physical location as well as time period. So wherever you leave the epic, you have to go back to get it at that location and time period. So as a result, I like to, when I'm done using the epic, I like to leave it at the end of time for this point in the game because it just makes it a lot easier to find it because then I don't have to figure out or try and remember where I left it last. So whenever you're done using the epic, I'd recommend you leave it at the end of time. Anyways, for this next little section, it's I recommend that you use the epic for this. Go to 600 AD and then just remember that instead of going to a gate, you want to go back to the epic so that we can use it to go back and forth between time periods, but also so that when we're done, we want to park it at the end of time. Okay, so in 600 AD, there are two chests here that we can get just in general, but then otherwise there are upgradable chests, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So first go to the Magic Cave, which is right now next to where the epic will appear, and this has a magic ring, which is pretty nice. So over here to the left, you'll see there is a little mini dungeon called the Sunken Desert. This was unlocked because I told a girl in 12,000 BC to plant a tree sapling in secret, and that's a little mini dungeon that we can do for a side quest later on in the game. Um, you can do it right now, it is kind of hard, um, but some of you may not have interacted with that girl or whatever, so... Um, but if you did, then that would unlock that, and I'll show you how to speak with that girl and tell her how to do the sapling thing uh, later, in, later on in the walkthrough as well. So don't worry about it if you missed your opportunity earlier. I will show you how to do that. Anyways, what we're doing is we're going to the poor village elder's house and interacting with the two chests there. And these sealed chests, it'll ask you, do you want to remove the item? And you say, no. The reason is because what we're doing is we're interacting with it and the pendant is charging up the item inside and upgrading it to a higher quality item. So if you don't open it right now and instead you open it in 1000 AD after you have interacted with it and charged it up, then it will be a higher quality item. So that's what we're doing is we're just running around 600 AD, interacting with all these upgradable chests, but not opening them on purpose so we can come back in 1000 AD and get the higher quality item instead. So there's two chests in Poor Village, Elder's House. There's one chest here in the Truce Village Inn, and it's upstairs next to the beds. And then there's one more that is in Guardia Castle. Now, as long as we're on our way there, you want to go ahead and grab the shelter from the enemy that is here in Guardia Forest. And then in the top right corner of Guardia Forest, in 600 AD anyways, there is a chest here as well. So remember there was a, next to the gate in 1000 AD Guardia Forest, there was a chest there. But then also here in 600 AD, that little section where that gate is in 1000 AD doesn't exist here in 600 AD. But right before that, there is a speed capsule inside a sealed chest here. So grab that one as long as we're passing through, then continue on towards Guardia Castle. Now this particular chest is up in the King's Tower, which is the one on the left. So just go up, like past the throne on the left side, and there is a chest over here, just like on the third screen, I think it is. So go ahead and interact with that. And once again, just don't pick up the item because we want to leave it here on purpose. And then go ahead and leave, go all the way back to 
to the epic and then go to 1000 AD. I think this is such a cool little detail for the developers to have in this game. Like, it's just such a, I don't know, like, it's one of those things where I feel like somebody would be like, what does this even mean? Why would it even ask me if I can remove it? And they look it up online and then people are talking about it. They're like, oh, that's awesome, you know? <laughs> but it's one of those things too where, you know, like, it's almost replay value, sort of where, like, you might have just grabbed it the first playthrough and then now you realize you can do something awesome with it. I just think it's really cool. So now back in 1000 AD, we can now run around and collect all those chests because we've charged them in the past, and so now they will be the higher quality item instead. So the first set is here in the poor village elder's house, and what this will do is it upgrades it from the vest quality to the plate slash mail instead. Now what these do is there are four of them, one of each color, so there's a white, black, red, and blue, and what these do is they will absorb elemental attacks of the appropriate color. So black will absorb shadow, for example. The other ones are all pretty self-explanatory. So how this works is that vests will, uh, will heal you for 50% of that elemental damage. So if, in the case of black, if you are hit with a shadow attack that does 80 damage normally, if you're wearing the vest, it will then heal you for half. So 40 health is what you will receive instead. So you'll be healed for 40 instead of taking 80 damage. Meanwhile, the the plate slash mail is the upgraded one and it will heal you for 100%. So you will actually heal for 80 instead of half the amount, which is really cool. Also, just so you know, all of these plate slash mail will actually, they have more armor than like anything else in this tier at this point in the game. So they're really high armor compared to everything else we're wearing. I think a lot of the stuff we're wearing right now is like in the 40s armor is kind of what we have. So these plates are actually have an, a physical armor value of 70, which is really high. That's super good for this point in the game. So not only is it amazing for elemental attacks, it's also really good for just guarding against physical attacks as well. It's just by far the best armor we can possibly have at this particular tier. It's just really, really good. So anyways, um, but it is also useful for the rest of the entire game because even after you've outleveled it from a pure armor standpoint, there are still battles where it's still the correct choice and it's just a really, really powerful item. So anyways, after you go to Truce Inn and upgrade that item as well and get that, you want to go to Garga Castle again, go to the King's Tower on the left side, go to the third screen and activate this chest to get the red plate, which is the last one. Now, before you leave and think you're all done and be proud of yourself, there is actually one more step we can do. You can go back to 600 AD and go open all those chests again to get the unupgraded version of those things, which is the vests. Because we've already collected the upgraded one, we can now get the unupgraded one as well. So you end up with a vest and a plate slash mail of each color, which is sweet. I think it's weird sometimes how like uh, they decide to follow temporal paradoxes or not in this game. Like sometimes they just like, you know, there is a definite cause and effect and other times it's just like you just break the rules entirely like this. <laughs> I do think this is kind of awesome though. The fact you can even do this is crazy. Uh, but it's just weird because like, okay, so one person is literally, so if one person's wearing the vest, one person's wearing the plate, then that means you literally have two people wearing the same item. Just the baby version of it, you know? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. You can't do that. Now, one quick note too, by the way, we still have ruby vests in our inventory, which is the 65 million BC armor that halves fire damage. And you do want to hang on to those still because um, you can still use that on your third character. So like if you have a red plate and a red vest, then you have your third character can have a ruby vest. So you want to, you can sell like one or two of the ruby vests, but I would recommend you hang on to one of them at least or one or two, however many you need, depending on how many items you have. So that you can fill up your party with fire resistance slash absorption. So anyways, the ruby vests are still worth keeping, just so you know, because if an enemy does all magic damage and it's all a particular element, then you can what you want to have items that you can use to counter that. So once you've collected all the goodies, you want to return to the epic and park it over at the end of time. Again, I think that's the best place to leave it just so that you don't forget it and leave it somewhere weird. Uh, but anyways, so next I'm going to go ahead and save and heal up and everything, and I'm going to go over all the items I collected. Now something to know is I have been playing in the Arena of Ages, and I won a whole bunch of good items that were in Tier 5. Now Tier 5 kind of encapsulates all of the things that were available inside those sealed chests, so I actually already have a lot of these items already, so I have duplicates of a lot of the things that you just saw me get, including all of those colored plates, which is really really, really powerful as well. I also got an extra guardian helm and an extra swallow for Chrono, which is the, those chests in the pyramid where we had to choose one or the other. I actually already have both, which is kind of strong. So here I'm just showing them just so you can see how good they are. Now again, between the two of them, I think the guardian helm is far more worthwhile because it's good for the entirety of the game. The swallow will eventually be replaced, so we won't be using it forever anyway. Other items that I got as I got a magic ring and a power ring. Those are both super nice, as well as a speed ring for plus three speed. That's pretty cool. The acuity ring for plus 10 accuracy slash hit will increase the damage for Luca and Marl for their physical attacks. Absolutely garbage. You should not use this. I feel like that's only... Yeah, I don't, it's just bad. If you want to do physical damage, you should be using somebody else. Like, you throw in Chrono, Ayla, or Robo, and you got some great physical damage, and then meanwhile, there's no reason to increase the girl's attack. 
Now, meanwhile, the golden earring is a terrible item. I think it's absolutely awful. The only real useful thing that you can do with it, in my opinion, is actually to boost Robo's health to guarantee you can get the crisis arm attack early, which I'll explain more what I mean by that later in the game, but that's kind of the only thing I think is useful with it. I think the most useful item otherwise that I got here was definitely the golden studs. Those are super nice. There's also the um, alluring top for slash charm top for Ayla, which will increase the success rate of her charm ability, which is, that's pretty nice. Um, I do feel like if you don't need to be charming, you should totally have a power ring in that slot instead, but the alluring top is nice. One quick note about the armors that I want to point out real quick is we got all these vests, right? And the, all of the vests are of the same quality, including the ruby vest. So here's the red vest, which will heal me for 50% of fire damage. Meanwhile, the ruby vest will just have 50% of fire damage. So, but the armor value as far as physical defense is the exact same. So just something to note, um, that's vest quality. In other words, all these red, blue, black, and white vests are all um, like 65 million BC quality, which we're already leveled past, honestly, as far as a few pure physical standpoint. However, there are times Times when it's still the best because you're fighting a lot of enemies that do elemental damage and they're all kind of doing the same type of elemental damage this is still a really good thing to do because it will help reduce all the damage you take quite a bit now something else you can do is all the plates are amazing all the plates are the best thing we can have by far i actually have a bunch of them because i won them in the arena of ages so i have tons i'm not going to be equipping all of my characters with a particular elemental plate though because that's a little bit overpowered but i do have them if i wanted to <laughs> Now, one other cool item we did win in one of those sealed chests is a Luminous Robe. It's kind of like the upgraded version of the Mist Robe, but the Luminous Robe will also give you plus five to magic defense, um, which is a very nice thing if you want to block like all different types of magic stuff. So ironically enough, I think the best character to put this on right now, it's females only, would be on Ayla because her magic defense is just pretty low in general. All right, so with all that optional collection out of the way, we're finally ready to continue on with the main quest. So hop back in the epic, hopefully you have it here at the end of time, and then you can go ahead and warp to 12,000 BC. So this is our way we can go there directly. We don't have to use gates anymore at all, assuming that you can gain access to the epic anyways. So warp to 12,000 BC, and at this point you can see the gate is still locked. We can't do anything to unseal it. And also the skyways have been blocked too, so we can't get to the sky. So even though we are here in the correct time period, we can't get back up to the Magic Kingdom at all. So instead you want to go over to the far left side of this continent where you'll find a cave which leads to Al Gedi, which is the city of the Earthbound Ones, where all the people who can't use magic. So one more quick note, I will talk about it in detail right now, but I'll just kind of skim over it um, later on in the walkthrough. But just something to know is that all the characters have an elemental affinity, even the ones that don't say they do. So, uh, you know, Chrono is lightning, is his element, but that also means he reduces incoming lightning damage by 20%. Now because of that, if you're going to have an enemy who is using lightning damage, you want to put the white plate, which will heal people for lightning damage instead, you want to put it on somebody other than Chrono because he already takes reduced damage from lightning anyway. So if you have three party members, you want to put the white plate and white vest on somebody else and then have Chrono just deal with it because he's going to take the least damage out of all your characters. So yeah, don't put blue armor on either Marl or Frog. Don't put black armor on Robo, for example. It's because you want to put it on the other characters that take 100% of damage instead so that way you can reduce it and make them more survivable. So that's how you want to optimize your item choice. So here in Al Getty, they have some pretty decent items in the shop. Now, a lot of these weapons I actually already have that I got from the Arena of Ages, so I'm just going to put those on. So I basically already purchased them and spent some time to get them earlier in the game. Now, the Zon Moto is the one that is for sale here, um, but I'm actually going to be wearing the Swallow, which is one of the items we could have potentially gotten from the sealed chests. Um, and it's not going to matter too much, as you'll see, just for this next little section anyways. Next, um, for again, for Marl and for Luke, I'm going to go ahead and put on the items that I would have purchased here. Same thing with Robo. Now, Robo, I actually do have some other other items that are after this, but I'm not going to put them on just yet because we haven't unlocked them yet. Now for Frog, the Radiant Blade is the one you can buy here. However, I'm going to put on the Rune Blade because uh, the Demon Slayer is similar quality and that is going to be in this very next area. We're, we're about to unlock the Demon Slayer right away. Between the Rune Blade and the Demon Slayer, I feel like the Rune Blade is a little bit nicer for this particular section, so that's what I'm going to do. Next, I'm going to go ahead and sell all my old stuff and all the duplicates that I already have. So I'm just going to get rid of all these lower tier ones just to uh, like clear out my inventory a little bit. So I should be a pretty similar power level to what you're expecting experiencing in your game ish chrono is kind of the exception because he's a little bit higher level now one of the only other weapons to consider too is i do have a demon slayer which is an item we're about to unlock in this next area very quickly and then i also have a rune blade rune blade is a similar quality between the two of them the difference is the demon slayer does more damage versus magical creatures meanwhile the rune blade has more magic on it the rune blade is a good item especially even late game honestly because the his frog's magic stat is very low and that will increase his healing so if you're going to be using frog as a healer i'd recommend you put on the rune blade we can also grab 
grab some of these radiant helms for the guys, which is pretty nice. Although just bear in mind that there is some helmets that we can charm off some nearby enemies here in just a little bit, which is very nice as well. So you can just, I would highly recommend you do that and that would be usable on either guys or girls. Now one thing you can do, at least on one of the girls, I would recommend is using that guardian helm because it will reduce physical damage by quite a bit. Very, very nice physical resistance. Now Luca's in this weird spot because she does have the Tabins um, outfits, whatever. These are all vest quality, which is kind of low, so it's 65 million BC quality. We're kind of out-leveling that. However, the speed is just too good to give up. Now as far as our armor slot, you can wear some of these colored vests, but unless you have a particular element you're trying to avoid specifically, it's not really good to be relying on these as far as physical defense. You're way better off with something else. We do have some Mesozoic Mail, which is kind of nice, but otherwise the plates that we won recently is super, super good. So if you have the colored plates, which we just got from the sealed chests, if you were following along with me, you should have one of each one of those. Now I currently have multiple because I did win some in the Arena of Ages. Now that's unusual, but just to show for a quick example is I'm going to put on one of each plate. Now something to realize with these, you should only have four total, one of each color, and you can just swap them back and forth. So if you just put on some other armor real quick on somebody else and then you swap items back and forth you should be able to have your three active players have a plate on them at all times right so you just by moving items back and forth now as a result if you look at my when i go to the buy tab the armor value on the plate is just higher than so all my guys currently have better helmets than what the radiant is and or they have the same then meanwhile for the luminous and radiant plate the colored plates are just better it's the they're just higher armor value than the plates and robes that sell here so I'd highly recommend you just use the plates and just swap them back and forth because it's just better because not only is it higher physical armor, but it's also will completely absorb other elemental stuff as well, which is just good. Okay, long explanations, but the summary of all that stuff, what, am I, what are my recommendations for this shop? There's actually a lot of things we can do here, so there's a lot of good items here. But what are my recommendations? My recommendations are for your chest piece, just wear the colored plates if you got them. If you didn't get them, then probably get the luminous robes and the radiant plate instead. If the, for the head pieces, you can go ahead and get radiant helms for the guys if you want to. However, there are some charmable helms nearby that are wearable by both genders, and it's really nice, and we'll be able to get those in here in just a second, actually. Meanwhile, for weapons, Frog is going to get an upgrade here, like, almost immediately, so I don't think it's worth buying his, but you can buy everybody else's if you want to, and that'll last for a little while. Otherwise, I'd recommend you stock up on Panacea slash Heal, and probably just sell all of your regular potions at this point if you haven't already. We're just out-leveled to the point where we don't use regular potions anymore, so you can just get rid of them because that just gives us less items to have to scroll through all the time. If you speak with all the people here, what you'll find is that the Earthbound ones are the, all the people that don't have magic, and a lot of them are missing right now because they have been conscripted to do construction on the Ocean Palace, and they've never been heard from again, so nobody knows what actually happened to them, and they're a little bit nervous about that. They also say that the Guru of Life challenged the Queen and told her that the way she was behaving was wrong, and this was all evil and stuff like that, so the Queen got mad, and she imprisoned him on the Mountain of Woe, which is our next destination. So they also say that the Gurus and Shala are kind of the only ones that actually treat the earthbound ones nicely and Shala comes here often actually to just hang out with them and stuff and the kids here especially just totally adore her but she hasn't been by here recently and that is because she's been helping with getting the mammon machine set up there in the ocean palace so that's what's going on right now and so they haven't come back here for a while so meanwhile the remaining earthbound ones are all the ones that are too old or too weak to work on the construction now speaking of Shala as I mentioned briefly earlier in the, the last videos I was saying that it's pretty obvious that the pendant we have is the exact same one that Shala has in other words we have the her pendant from the future is the one that we have in our possession. It's been passed down through the Guardia family, and then Marl got in possession of it. Now, I was saying back in the Footsteps Follow chapter where the Reptites stole our gate key, and then we had to go get it back from them in the Reptite layer, I was saying that there was a worse item that they could have potentially taken that would have really messed things up for us, and my what I'm most referring to was the pendant itself. Because if they had taken that instead, it would have seemed like, well, we can still continue on with our adventure because we have the gate key, and like, yes, it's a family heirloom and stuff like that, but it wouldn't have been the end of the world, or at least it wouldn't have seen that way at first glance, but they wouldn't. Ha our characters would have no way of knowing that it was became vitally important for all the stuff we're doing in these chapters. I actually do have a bunch of more cool things to share regarding the pendant, but I don't want to do it right now because it's kind of spoilery. So, uh, moving on, you can go ahead and heal at one of the nearby uh, people here in Algeti, and then go ahead and save at the Sparkly. In the next room, there is a strength capsule in the corner, so I'm going to throw all my strength on Frog because he has the lowest and he's our a power user. And then meanwhile, I'm going to put my speed on Luca and Frog to bring them both up to 12. So now all my characters have at least 12 speed 
which is awesome. That is a, a super nice thing because um, as long as you have at least 12 speed, then when you use the haste spell, then it doubles your speed, but only up to 24. It caps at 24. So if all my characters have 12, then that means that if I have Marl in my party, I can get their speed up to the max possible, which is super nice. So next I'm going to throw all my magic caps. I'm going to like spread it out a little bit evenly-ish, but I am going to focus a little bit harder on Ayla. I actually do have more uh, magic capsules than most people do because I want a bunch in the Arena of Ages, so that's unusual. So you probably don't have quite as many as I do, so you can either evenly distribute it or you can throw them all in one character. If you're going to throw them all in one character, I'd highly recommend and Ayla because she gets more benefit from magic than the other two characters by far. In fact, you'll see what I mean by this here very shortly because in the very next video there is a boss whom Ayla can absolutely destroy him if you give her a bunch of magic. So I'm actually going to be using that strategy and it's pretty disgusting actually. It's really, really powerful. So I'm going to go ahead and throw the alluring top on Ayla real quick because I'm going to be doing some charming. And then I've explained this principle earlier in this video, but in general you want to throw the opposite element of, or whatever, a different element than what the characters are. So for example, Frog and Mar that are water element, so you want to throw a red plate or just any other color, any color other than blue. And the reason is because that way if you have, because they already um, they already reduce incoming water damage by 20%. So if I give them a different color and then put the blue plates on some other character, and what that means is the total damage your party is taking is reduced by quite a bit. So it just, that's the most efficient way to do that. Right now I'm just putting plates on all my characters because I have an abundance of them and it's the highest armor thing we have right now. Now in this next section, you should totally bring Ayla with you and charm all these mud bees. I just brain farted on. I was trying to get some dual text, I think is what I was trying to do, just to make sure I had enough TP that I'd learned all the abilities between these three characters, because we're going to be using them a lot here in the next little while and for this upcoming boss. So I was thinking, I, I don't know, that was what I was thinking at the time, but yes, you totally want to charm these guys because they drop rainbow helms, and that charmable item is even better than the Radiant Helms that we can buy in Al Getty just a second ago, which is what I was talking about. There's no, you don't really have to buy those items because we're gonna get better helmets right here, right now. So anyways, um, I should have charmed all four of these guys and that would have been a smart thing. But yeah, these four Mud Beasts, these are the only ones in the entire game and they give you Rainbow Helms and they also don't respawn when you defeat them. So after we kill these guys, we leave the area and come back, there will be no Mud Beasts here. So that's a sad thing. So anyways, I totally missed my opportunity and messed this up. Now, as far as the boss up ahead too, by the way, you also want to charm stuff off of them. So I would highly recommend you bring Ayla both for the Mud Beasts as well as for the boss. And I didn't do that. This particular recording is me just showing um, Luca and Marl real quick and for this upcoming fight. And one of the things I thought was there's a red and a blue beast up ahead, so I thought they had some elemental attacks, so I put on a red vest. I've since learned that's not true, and they only do physical damage, so you'd be better off just wearing any of the plates at all. Any, whatever your highest physical defense is, like for example, um, if I had a nicer, like such as a rainbow helm, I could throw that on Luca because she's currently wearing the uh, Tavin helm, which gives plus 10 to magic defense, which is awesome, but this particular boss doesn't do any magic damage at all. You want to use elemental attacks on him, but you want to want to use physical defense on your characters. So physical de defense for you, magical offense is what you want. First of all, let me just say that the blue beast can be charmed to get a mermaid cap, which is a really valuable item at this point in the game, especially if this is your first playthrough. I think it's a very, very valuable item, so I would highly recommend you do this fight with Ayla, which is a slightly different strategy. And I'll show that here in a little bit. Right now, I'm just showing more of a traditional fight, and what you want to know about this boss is the fact that, so this is more of a traditional team composition for this fight, is to use Marl and Luca to hit the opposing element so you can do good damage to the colored beasts. Now, the first thing to know about this boss, though, is the fact that he counterattacks. So when you hit the Mud Imp, if either one of the two Mud Beasts are still alive and awake or whatever, then what'll happen is that he will counterattack if you hit the Mud Imp itself. So you want to avoid hitting the Mud Imp, so don't use, like, AoE attacks, don't use Fire Whirl. For example, you want to use single target things such as Fire Sword, or, you know, you can use, like, Robo Tackle or whatever. There's different abilities you can use, whatever. Just use single target attacks to hit the, the Mud Beast as hard as you possibly can to take them out one at a time. The only other attack that the boss has is to throw a rock, which does pretty decent damage and it also puts your characters to sleep. However, he will also throw them at the Mud Beast if they are currently incapacitated as well, which does damage to them too, funnily enough. He can't actually technically kill his own Mud Beast by attacking them with stuff, which is kind of funny. Now, I mentioned this earlier in the walkthrough, but I just think it's a good refresher to point it out right now, is that if the boss uses a negative status effect on you and you already, it doesn't remove the positive status effects. Like, because I used haste with Marl, now my characters have this border around them, and what happens is if the boss uses his rock and it puts your character to sleep, then that red border just goes away after that, so it makes it look like you're not hasted anymore, maybe. Graphically, don't worry about it. You don't have to recast haste because you are still benefiting from that buff. 
So speaking of status effects, one of the abilities that I've been meaning to talk about for a while that I've never really had the opportunity to is Marl's Provoke ability, which I think is absolute garbage. It looks like one of the worst abilities in the game, because what it does is it applies the Chaos debuff to an enemy, but it's just so infrequently usable that it's just bad. Um, so for example, what it does, what Chaos does is it's confusion. It makes enemies attack their allies sometimes, so they can occasionally attack their, their brethren. But it's just not very good because, like, because we always have three people in our party. What that means is that the chances of them attacking an ally is super low. Because, you know, in this example, it's if I cast onto my beast, and unlike Pokemon, they don't attack themselves. So as a result, they can only attack the, you know, if I cast it on the red beast, for example. That means they can only attack the blue beast, the mud imp, or one of our three characters. So there's only a two out of five chance for it to actually do anything beneficial for us. Otherwise, it makes no difference at all. So it's not useful for regular combat because at that point, if you're going to be wasting a turn with Marl to do that, you could have been spending that time and that mana casting a different ability that would just kill them in one hit anyway. So rather than just like, like what's the point in provoking them and prolonging the battle to maybe sort of potentially cause extra damage to your foes and keep them distracted for a little bit-ish when you could have just killed them in the first place. It doesn't make any sense. So it's only practical for like boss battles like this, but even this boss battle is a great example of when it's just bad because he throws rocks to, to remove status effects on his mud beasts, which will in turn make them... It just removes the status effects. So you don't have to worry about it. I mean, sure, that ties up the... Uh, the mud in for a bit because he's wasting time like removing the status effect but we wasted time applying the status effect in the first place it was only for a chance for us to get some additional damage so it's not all that good and if the mud beasts attack the boss i'm not entirely sure but it might even cause the counter attack the x-strike counter so if you provoke the mud beasts and then they attack the boss and then he counters by hitting us with x-strike we take more damage than if we just left the enemies by themselves it's just bad it's just bad all around like ugh. I just find it sad because it's like any situation where you could potentially use Provoke, it's just not the right choice. There's just better options. Like at that point, if you're going to be using Marl just for that, you'd be better off swapping around with a different character and just dealing lots of damage. Again, you know, generally speaking, you can keep your healers out of the party unless you specifically need them for the fight. Um, and then that way you can just have them heal out of combat. And then meanwhile, you just use damage dealers for most of your fights and you can just demolish just about everything in the game. So it doesn't really matter. So, in, so likewise, as far as status effects go, a much more effective ability is Hypno Wave with Luka, and this fight is no exception to that. By using Hypno Wave, I can put the beast to sleep. As long as both of them are asleep, it's only a chance for it to happen, but as long as both of the beasts are asleep, then the boss can't counterattack. So just by repeatedly using Hypno Wave over and over again with Luka, you can then have the boss isolated by himself so we can take him down first and completely ignore the beast after that. Just be ready to wake the beast back up in case the boss throws a rock at the mud beasts and wakes them back up. This battle actually ends as soon as the Mud Imp is defeated, and doesn't actually have that much life. However, it does have a heal, so it can heal itself pretty good. And it also um, has very high resistance, in particular against physical. So physical attacks are just absolutely awful against this boss, so you don't want to use that. So magical attacks are the way to go, so you can use some magical dual attacks in particular. That would be really good. Uh, but otherwise, just keep using some of your other stuff. Now, as far as Ayla is concerned, I would highly recommend that you charm all the enemies as soon as possible. They have some really good items here, in particular the Mermaid Cap, which is on the Blue Beast. That is a really good item, and I think that's useful for the entirety of the game, especially if this is your first playthrough, you're not in New Game Plus, then it's a very nice item, or you're not going through the Arena of Ages like I am, and thus I have a whole ton of plates. So if I already have a bunch of blue plates, then the Mermaid Cap is kind of worthless, and I don't really need it, but um, if you don't have a whole ton of those, things. The mermaid cap is amazing. It's a super good option for you. So my biggest recommendations for this fight is ideally bring Ayla with you so you can get the mermaid cap in particular, and then otherwise, as far as other characters, then you just ideally want either Luca to put everything to sleep, or you want some kind of magic damage dealer to attack the mud beast. You can attack the, uh, the beast themselves, you can attack with whatever you want. The boss is only vulnerable to magic though, so basically magic damage dealers is what you want. Like, frog isn't that great uh, for this fight, robo is not that great for this fight, uh, the best ones by far are going to be Marl and Luca. Now, unlike the flea battle in Magus's castle, I was saying, for example, in that fight that you don't even have to worry about the sleep status effect because the boss will just use like a full screen attack and it will wake up your characters anyway, so it doesn't really matter. For this fight, unfortunately though, this boss will use can use a counter attack and stuff with X Strike, which is bad. It has the charge ability. It can throw rocks at you. So like. All those things combined, they're all single target abilities. So you could have it happen where he knocks out one of your guys, puts him to sleep, and then you're asleep for the entirety of the fight, and it's just awful. So you can very quickly have the spiral out of control where all three of your characters are, are asleep because you just didn't deal with it fast enough. So as a result, I feel like it's very smart for this battle to buy a bunch of Panacea slash heal, 
from El Getty shop, which is what I did earlier in this video. And I was making that recommendation, and that's why. It's because for this fight, it is super nice because I would just highly recommend you use Panacea slash Heal every time as soon as you can. That's pretty much the fight. Use fire or ice on the opposing element ice piece if you want to. Otherwise, you can ignore them and fight the boss. Just make sure that you put them to sleep first with Hypno Wave if you want to go for the strategy instead. As soon as the boss is defeated, then we will win the fight. He doesn't actually have that much life, but he is very highly resistant to physical, so you're better off using magical. Just anything magical. You can go ahead and use like dual text like Thunder Chomp slash Volt Bite, and that's okay. However, um, the physical portion of that is going to be significantly reduced, so I think it's better off like trying to have Ayla do healing or something instead. That's how it's done. If you enjoyed this, be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. As always, you guys are awesome, you have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.